evening, everybody, and a very, warm, a very warm welcome to all from Stationers Hall for the 2022 Archive Evening, presenting the topic of Stationers and their books. Books lie at the heart of the company's existence. They are part of our heritage. If we were in the hall tonight, we would see books in the decoration of our hall. They're also part of the badge that I'm wearing tonight. Without books, the Stations Company would never have been such a force in the cultural history of Britain, nor become such a big player in business and the City of London. Printing and publishing were the innovative and disruptive technologies of the 16th and 17th centuries. The evening would tell the stories about books and their connections with the company. The history of the company is fascinating. In my year as master, I think I've done more reading and research about the history than in my previous 20 years of membership put together. It is a really fascinating topic. In the industrial book printing world of today, of today which I know and love, many millions of books and titles are produced each and every week. There is such a plethora of choice that consumers are completely spoilt and can pick up and read almost any book on any topic. It is therefore inconceivable that any one single book could have the impact on society which some of the books being discussed tonight achieved. It is therefore going to be fascinating to hear from our panel the story of these books and their connections with the station's company. The conversation tonight will be moderated by Liverman Gordon Johnson, so a big thank you to him and to all of our speakers this evening. So sit back, rela relax, enjoy the adult beverage in your glass and immerse yourself in this evening's discussion. Over to you, Gordon. Thank you, Master, for that uh, in introduction. And you are quite right. I mean, books are at the heart of the stationers company. And even in this era of new means of disseminating information and where the book is being redefined uh, to come out as an electronic publication, books still matter and the books in paper are books, are things that will be preserved indefinitely. They are really an important way in which we are able to talk to the past and where we are able to get uh, recreation and information uh, and all sorts of things that make us properly human. And of course, as the Stationers Company has uh, indicated over the years, books, however manufactured and disseminated, are a way of making money. They are also, of course, a way of losing money. And so it's a really fascinating uh, business uh, to uh, the creation of the book. It begins with the author, but then all sorts of things happen uh, before it gets to the reader. And then the reader does all sorts of things with the book. So this evening, we're going to focus on four um, books. We've got four speakers who are going to talk about particular books. If you want to um, ask a question, please use the chat facility at the bottom of your screen. Between each speaker, there will be a moment where we will have a time to put a question to that speaker. Um, and at the end, there will be time for the panel uh, to be subjected to questions uh, via, the, uh, via the chat. Um, this evening is a straightforward Zoom uh, session. I hope I haven't taunted uh, uh, bad fortune by saying straightforward, um, but it is uh, also a little bit innovative even for us because three of the talks have been recorded and will, uh, will be uh, presented by, uh, by Lucy. Uh, and that's why we need to have a question between, um, between the, the, the speakers. Um, but all the speakers are here. So if they look different, you know that that's been a recording. Okay. 
So we're starting um, with Margaret Wills. I should say I should have said also that all our speakers are authors. Uh, we're starting with Margaret Wills, who uh, was a was a publisher and is an author, and she she left publishing to write an absolutely wonderful book called Reading Matters, and since then she has published a number of books uh, on gardening, on botanics, on Shakespeare, on Evelyn and uh, Pepys, and the most recent book that's just hit the shops is of course uh, this wonderful new book about uh, St Paul's Churchyard in the shadow of St Paul's Cathedral, which starts in the dim and distant past of the Middle Ages and comes right up to the, uh, to the present day. Um, so you should rush out and get your copy before it goes out of print. And Margaret is going to talk about Fox's Book of Martyrs. So can I now hand over to Margaret, please? I'm going to talk about one of the books that is now in the station's library. This is known as Fox's Book of Martyrs, although its real name is Acts and Monuments. The author, John Fox, was a fellow of Magdalen College, Oxford, who resigned his fellowship in 1545 with, uh, with his reformist religious views, he was unwilling to conform to the statutes that had been imposed upon the university. The mid 1540s was a time of great political and religious uncertainty as Henry VIII grew older, suffering from all kinds of bodily ailments and ever more unpredictable. The dramatic fall of his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, in 1540, had sparked an intense power struggle at the royal court. The accession seven years later of Henry, Henry's son, Edward, ushered in a period of Protestant reform, but all too soon the situation radically changed, with his half-sister Mary Tudor returning the English church to Rome. Fox retired to the continent, and spent his time in collecting material to record not only the persecutions suffered by Protestants under Mary, but also to produce a history of the English church from the time of John Wycliffe and the Lollards two centuries earlier. When Elizabeth succeeded Mary in 1558, it was all change again. John Fox could return and become an ordained priest. His Book of Martyrs was first published in 1563, by the Protestant stationer John Day. He, like Fox, had experienced perilous years, including a time in Newgate Prison, where he shared a cell with John Rogers, who was the first martyr of Mary Tudor's reign to be burned at the stake. Conversations with Rogers may well have inspired Day to take on Fox's ambitious project. This is the imprint of John Day. He was an ebullient character, as you can see, he's like, he says, arise for it is day. And ambish, ambitious the project was, the book ran to over 1800 pages, involving different typefaces, columns and marginal notes. There were 50 woodcut illustrations, probably produced in the Netherlands, and evidence suggests that they arrived late, generating a nightmare situation. Day is thought to have invested the staggering sum of a thousand pounds in the venture. In the end, it was all worth it. The book proved the best-selling publication of the 16th century. Fox's title page showed both men and women listening to, to uh, uh, the word with Bibles in their laps. And the Book of Martyrs was a particular favorite of women who often bequeathed their copies in their wills. This sentiment lies at the heart of the quarrel the Lollards had with the established church, for well, they had been determined to read the scriptures in English. There had been vernacular Bibles in Anglo-Saxon England, but these disappeared with the Norman Conquest. Although there is no record of John Wycliffe himself uh, undertaking a translation, he was nevertheless denounced for the crime of giving ordinary people the opportunity 
to consider the scriptural texts for themselves. His followers did undertake such translations, and although many of these were rounded up and burnt, about 250 Bibles and New Testaments have survived as manuscripts, for this was the time before printing. So that the centre for this covered production was the craftsman who lived and worked in the area just to the north of St Paul's Cathedral. With the arrival of the printing press, the church authorities were faced with the threat of English translations in thousands rather than hundreds. The catalyst for these was the publication in the Swiss city of Basel in 1516 of Novum Instrumentum, a Latin translation by the Dutch humanist Erasmus of the New Testament. This was taken up by William Tyndale, an, an Oxford scholar who sought permission from the Bishop of London to print an English edition. Snugged, he left from Germany and the New Testament was published in 1525 with copies smuggled down the Rhine and into Britain. Although Henry VIII, along with bishops such as John Fisher of Rochester, condemned such publications and burned them in public in St Paul's churchyard, the tide was turning. This was partly due to the king himself with his great matter, wanting to divorce his first queen, Catherine of Aragon, and to marry Anne Boleyn. Failing to secure the Pope's blessing, and with the help of Thomas Cromwell, who held reformist views, he asserted his supremacy as head of the Church of England. Bishop Fisher was one of the people who refused to accept this, and as a result was executed. Fox was, was to show this overturning of the established church order in a graphic illustration with the king throwing down Fisher and Pope Clement while he's watched by Thomas Cromwell and by uh, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. This turnaround did not come in time to save Tyndale, who had been captured in the Low Countries and was strangled and burnt at the stake in Vilvoorde Castle just outside Brussels in 1536. His haunting last words were said to be, Lord, open the King of England's eyes, as shown in another illustration from Fox. It's, but in a remarkably short period, Tyndale's wish was to be fulfilled, for the reformist Thomas Cromwell was in the ascendant. John Rogers, the, the person who had, was later to share the cell with John Day, took Tyndale's translation of the New Testament and amalgamated it with the work of, of Miles Coverdale to create what is known as the Matthew Bible. This was given the King's gracious license, shortly followed by the Great Bible of 1539. The struggle to have the scriptures in English was a theme adopted by John Fitz Fox in the Book of Martyrs, and it hit a chord with the Elizabethan establishment. Every cathedral church was ordered to have a copy, and many parishes followed suit. Every Protestant household that could afford to do so bought a copy or, as well, sometimes displaying it in their hall as a public statement of their faith. Fox argued that the technology of printing was part of God's providential design, writing, the blessed wisdom and omnipotent power of the Lord began to work for his church not only with sword and target to subdue his exalted adversaries, but with printing, writing and reading to convince darkness by light, error by truth, ignorance by learning. It has been established, it es es estimated that between 1563 and 1616, 28,000 copies were sold of unabridged, unabridged editions, with thousands more sold of abridgments including some for children. It is extraordinary to think that this was considered appropriate reading for children, for the woodcuts, the woodcuts that we've seen are often brutal in their subject matter, showing the punishments meted out to Lollards and later to Protestants. Among the woodcuts is an illustration of a member of the stationer's company, James Bainham, standing at the feet of the, of the uh, uh, preacher at Paul's Cross, in 1532. The cross was an open air pulpit that stood in the northeastern part of 
St Paul's Churchyard, and from the Middle Ages onwards was the place of all kinds of pronouncements. The Victorian historian Thomas Carlyle described it as the Times newspaper of its time. Bainham had been arrested for carrying the works of Martin Luther and William Tyndale, and despite being tortured on the orders of Sir Thomas More, he had refused to inform on his friends. Accepting the chance to recant, he was taken to the cross, wearing a white shroud and carrying a lighted candle and a sheaf of wooden faggots as a warning of his fate, should he relapse. But so troubled was Bainham that he attended a service the following Sunday, again carrying banned works. His arrest followed and he was burned in Smithfield in April as a heretic. The book that belongs to the Stationers' Company is from the 1641 printing, that is just before the outbreak of the English Civil War. By this time, responsibility for its production had passed from the Day family to the company's English stock, alongside Salters and Almanacs. This serves as a reminder that religious views continued to be bitterly fought over. We have to remember that Stephen College, the, the joiner who produced the fine gallery at Stations Hall after the Great Fire, was himself executed for his vehement Protestant beliefs, the last of the Oxford Martyrs. Versions of Fox's Book of Martyrs continued to be published in its original form right through to the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Margaret. That was a, a very lovely account of the uh, of the movement to have the the scriptures in English, and of the uh, of the violence of the dis of the debates that accompanied um, that. You say that the, the the company's copy of Fox's book is a 17th century uh, copy. Do we do we know roughly how how many earlier imprints there were of it and and how widely they were they they have survived in other libraries? Um, it was it was uh, uh, published um, regularly throughout the sixteenth century and early seventeenth century. Uh, there are. Uh, when I looked at the, um, the copies that are, uh, are in the uh, British Library, uh, it, 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 was it was constantly being reprinted. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure when it passed from the Day family, because um, John Day's son was, a, was also a, a master stationer, um, uh, and I'm not sure when it actually became part of the English stock. Um, I only found out that it was part of the English stock quite uh, Robin Myers, ever, ever of uh, the authority on these things, pointed it out to me. And I would actually like to try and find out a bit more uh, with Ruth, uh, with, with our archivist, because it, uh, it's interesting when it, when it did actually pass to the, to the company. But it continued to be published uh, by, by the, by the uh, stationers in, through the uh, 18th century. And then other people began to um, to uh, do editions of it with with uh, accompanying notes. Um, so it had become the, by that time perhaps of antiquarian interest rather than uh, a, a absolute support of the English Church. But it, it must surely have have been a very valuable um, publishing asset for the English stock to have uh, to have taken over. Uh, absolutely yeah have generated a lot of revenue in the in the 17th century uh, to support uh, the other publications of the english stock yes and what what's of course it, it was a very expensive book uh because of the woodcuts mm -hmm. um and uh the, and it was i was interested to find that the 1641 um edition that it belongs to the stationers um has the same title page as the original so they reuse the blocks that is interesting yes yes well perhaps we'll, we'll be able to come back to fox um 
at, at the end of the uh, of, of the other of the other talks. Um, so now we're going to move on to court assistant Paul Wilson, who is also an author. He's written uh, books about money and finance and the state. And uh, a year or so ago, he wrote uh, a very nice little book about uh, pilgrims and the pilgrims to the North American continent um, and, and printing. And he has just sent off um, a new book uh, to uh, his publisher called A Frost, um, a, a Frost of Cares, which is about prisoner poets in the Tower of London. Now, Paul is going to tell us a really interesting story um, about Camden's uh, remarkable uh, work, Britannia, or a chronolo chronographical description of Great Britain and Ireland and its translation into English. Paul. Good evening, I'm Paul Wilson and I'm going to talk about the company's copy of Camden's Britannia, the first English edition of 1610. I'm very grateful to Gordon Johnson of the Archives Committee for inviting me to speak, to Ruth Frendo, our archivist who's provided so many of the images I'm going to use, and to David Pearson, our honorary librarian, for his advice on the binding of the book and for reviewing my text. I'll say a few words at the end about how this book came into the company's collection. So, let's start with the exterior. The binding's an English one, probably made in London, and it's more or less contemporary with the imprint date of the book, book 1610. It's described as a centre and corner piece binding of gilt tooled parchment, and you can see some of the evidence of the gilt there, over pasteboards. It's a decorative style that was very much in vogue in English binding work in the late 16th and early 17th century. It would have been an upmarket expensive binding when it was first made, and that fits with the overall quality of the condition of the book, as you'll see as we go through it. William Camden's Britannia was a very important book in its time and remains the leading Elizabethan work of choreography bringing together the research of Camden and earlier antiquarians uh, on the subjects of geography, topography, history, and the antiquities of England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. It was part of a wave of study of those countries, which did much to shape the understanding. It was published and printed by two prominent stationers who were closely associated with these sorts of key publications in the latter part of the 16th century and the early part of the 17th century. Here on the title page, you'll see the names of George Bishop at the bottom there, who was master of the Stationers' Company six times, and John Norton, a master three times. They were prominent members of the Shropshire Mafia, which dominated the company in the last years of the 16th century and the early years of the 17th century. Bishop was responsible for the publication of Hacklett's Principal Navigations, promulgating the myth that England was a leader in global navigation and exploration. He was also one of the publishers of Hollinshead's Chronicles, the source book for some of Shakespeare's history plays. Norton was master of the company three times, as I have said, and we mark his generosity at our cakes and ale ceremony every year. He seems to have led an interesting life, because it's known that he acted at one point as a covert courier for secret correspondence between Robert Cecil, Elizabeth I's minister, and James VI of Scotland. The book made a big impact in England and amongst scholars on the continent and was prominent enough at one point to be banned by the Spanish Inquisition. Our copy is the seventh edition, which you might think is not particularly special, but in fact it is and it has an additional special significance for the stationers' company, which I'll come on to. But first, something about uh, Camden. Uh, this is the man as portrayed by Marcus Gerrits the Younger, born in 1551 and died in 1623. He lived through all of the long reign of Elizabeth I and much of the reign of James I. James I. 
was a Londoner. His father was a, uh, uh, a member of the Worshipful Company of Peter's Failers. Uh, and he studied at Magdalen College in Christchurch, Oxford, but left without a degree, which was not that unusual back then. In 1575, he became usher of Westminster School, which gave him plenty of time to pursue field studies during the holidays. In 1577, he began work on Britannia, researching the work of earlier antiquarians, learning Old English and Welsh, and traveling around the country, paying visits north to Carlisle, and to Adrian's Wall in 1599. He also visited Yorkshire and Lancashire and went west to Wiltshire, Wales and Devon. In 1593, he was promoted to be headmaster of Westminster School. And in 1597, he became Clarence Sir King of Arms, one of the most senior heralds at the College of Arms. As the college was a respected center of antiquarian studies, this appointment was designed to free up more time for his studies in that field. Here Camden in his College of Arms tabard is represented uh, in the funeral procession of Elizabeth I. The first edition was published in Latin in 1586. The book was a runaway success, clearly appealing to the intellectual spirit of the times. A further five Latin editions had appeared by 1607. The 1607 edition, still in Latin, was vastly improved by the inclusion of many fine copper plate engraved maps produced by the Dutch engraver William Kipp. Here's an example of the um, excellent copper plate engravings we see in the book. Uh, William Kipp and the English engraver William Hall, most of which were maps of the counties of England displayed individually rather than in groupings as had previously been the norm. So here's Middlesex, and here's um, Berkshire. And it's worth noting uh, on both of these uh, images, the very wide margins um, around the images, they're very, they've been very generous with the um, use of paper. Uh, there's no cropping of the images, no cutting into the images or anything like that. And the generosity in using the paper fits in with the quality of the binding. In other words, this was a, a high quality production uh, and probably designed, pulled together for somebody who was prepared to pay quite a bit of money for it. In keeping with the uh, spirit of a choreography where the book draws on a wide range of material, um, uh, Britannia includes woodcuts of striking antiquities. Here, for instance, is a woodcut representation of the small cross reputedly discovered by monks at the Abbey of Glastonbury, which purports to mark the burial place of King Arthur. And here's a woodcut of a Roman coin. Here is Stonehenge. And here from the area of uh, Port Talbot is the Bodvok stone, um, a 6th or 17th century burial marker stone for the tribal leader of that name in the west of England. This gives a sense of the wide geographical and historical range of Camden's interests, which contributed to the great success of the work. It's very interesting also to note uh, on uh, this page on the top left, the head of there, relates to the, um, the name of the Celtic tribe, it's the Latin name of the Celtic tribe, that used to occupy, occupy this area of Britain. And again, you can see in the area of Wiltshire, where Salisbury, uh, where uh, Stonehenge is, uh, another Latin name of the Celtic tribe that occupied that area. So, um, Camden has an interesting place in the Stationers' Company archives. <clears throat> when books were registered for copyrights in the company's registers, they were usually approved by an external representative of the Bishop of London or some other eminent authority, plus one or two of the company's wardens. Just occasionally, the approval was given by an author who combined personal interest in the work with an official authority. Thus, Francis Bacon, who was appointed in 1597, the first ever Queen's Council, 
uh, proved the copyright of his famous essays in the company register in that year. Um, and here in um, January 1599, um, in fact, it's January 1600 New Style, um, Camden can be seen approving for copyright a book called Reges Reginae Nobiles, etc., relating to the tomb monuments and epitaphs of Westminster Abbey. Camden was, in fact, the anonymous publisher of the book, so he approved the copyright of his own book. Um, uh, and if you look uh, carefully in this uh, copyright registration on the second line down, the word third from the end of the line, you can see Mr. Camden. Um, so there he is um, exercising his authority to, um, to approve copyright registration. And again, on the 24th of July, so it's the second of the two registrations here, um, he's noted as Camden Clarence, sir. So again, second registration down, second line down, the last two words in that line, Camden Clarence, sir, approving for Ralph Mabb's copyright, a book called A Display of Heraldry, written by John Gwilym, one of the junior heralds. And of course, a senior herald and much respected antiquarian. Camden would have commanded the right sort of authority to approve such a work. So here we have an author who understands something of the workings of the stationer's company and enjoys some degree of authority in the copywriting process. He's been dealing with two of the most prominent stationers of the late Elizabethan and early Jacobean era, Bishop of Norton. And by 1607, his work has gone through six Latin editions, enjoying great success in England and on the continent. He may have concluded it was time for an English edition to broaden out the readership, or it may have been suggested to him by Bishop of Norton. However the conclusion was reached, he now needed to find a capable translator, and this is where the stationers were able to help, but through a rather unexpected connection. On 26th of June, Henry Holland, uh, son of Philemon Holland, uh, a doctor of physic of Coventry, was apprenticed to John Norton, one of the publishers of Camden's Britannia. Um, this um, Henry Holland uh, would have been far advanced in his apprenticeship by the time the latest Latin edition was published with its excellent copper plate maps in 1607. Henry may have been bold enough to suggest this to Norton and Bishop that his father would make a worthy translator of the monumental Britannia. Indeed, Philemon had already made a mark as a translator from Latin to English, having produced the first English translation of Livy in 1600, a massive folio volume of nearly 1500 pages. In the following year, he published the first English translation of Pliny's History of the World. In his own lifetime, Holland was well regarded for the quality of his translations and must have seemed the obvious candidate for the role of translator of Camp. The fact that his son was apprenticed to one of the two key publishers of Britannia must have helped. It seems, however, that Camden was not satisfied with the translation and complained about it. Nevertheless, it was Philemon Holland's translation that remained the only English version of the book in Camden's lifetime and for the next 85 years. Henry was made free of the company in 1608 and published a number of works in his own right. He assisted his father with uh, his later publications in the 1630s, including the translation of Xenophon's Carapedia. Here is the title page of Carapedia with an image at the bottom of Philemon produced in his own lifetime. Although the title page does not list Henry as co-publisher, he is listed as such by the English short title catalog. Henry served in the Earl of Denby's regiment during the early years of the Civil War on the parliamentary side, but by 1647 had fallen into poverty. Nothing more is heard of him after 1649. This is an excellent copy of the first English edition of Britannia, in first class condition with wonderful copper plate engravings. It has a special significance for us because of the links between a leading Elizabethan author who was also empowered to, empowered to authorize works in our copyright registers, 
two of the leading stations of the day, the foremost translator into English of Latin classics in its time, and the connection to an apprentice station. Now, this book was given to the company by liveryman Michael Rogers and his late mother, also a member of the livery, Margaret Rogers. Michael's grandfather, Sidney Hodgson, and uncle Wilfred Hodgson were members of the Hodgson's book auctioneering family and both past masters of the stations company. Michael comments that the first Hodgson to become a master was in the 1820s and the business remained in the family many generations. His grandfather, Sidney Hodgson, received the coveted silver medal for his work on the archives in the 1950s with Robin Myers. I hope all will agree it is an extremely generous gift and one worthy of being part of our collection. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. What a wonderful, what a wonderful story and what wonderful detective work has gone into, uh, into uh, tracing all those printers and publishers and translators and apprentices. Is, is there, I mean, it, it's interesting that when Camden is doing the research for this, he's actually traveling around the country, uh, presumably uh, going to libraries, country house libraries or um, cathedral libraries, or do we know anything about his source, where, where his source came from? where his sources were. I think you're muted, Paul. I think you're muted, Paul. No, we've... No, you, you, you're still muted. There we are. No. no I th I think we, we we Paul we we've still got no sound from you today. Let, let let's pend questions to you unt until the end, and perhaps we can um, in in the meantime work work out how to how to rest how to restore you i'm sorry about that <laughs> Never mind. anyway so, so so let us um let me remind you to please put questions into uh into the chat uh for uh for, for later on um and we're going to move now to david pearson who is the company's honorary librarian uh, and we're very glad to uh, have him as as librarian, given his uh, his distinction um, in that craft over many many uh, years. The uh, the company's library uh, is is really very special and very um, uh, in in two ways. One, as the master said at the beginning, uh, it it provides. Uh, some very uh, rare and distinguished books that um, feature in in the hall and certainly in the um, in the reconstruction uh, that has been going on. They will be uh, these great books will be on display, and then we have a specialist collection, uh, a working library that supports the archivist, uh, Dr. Ruth Frendo, um, and. The scholars that come to use the uh, use the archive and benefit from uh, the great collection that is in that that is the Stationers Company's um, archive and that this evening uh, celebrates. Now, David is also uh, an author with a distinguished list of, of books, and most recently he published with Oxford um, a wonderful book called Book Ownership in Stuart, England. And he's going to talk about some bindings from the early 17th century. So David, over to you now, please. Thank you, Gordon. Um, and I hope the technology is working okay. 
um, for everybody here. Uh, I mean, I, I can see my slides on my screen and I can see me, and I hope that everybody out there can see it and hear it too, the, the joys of Zoom, the joys of technology, etc. Um, anyway, um, I would like to talk about some books that have got a, a rather different kind of connection with the company. I'd like to show some 17th century books whose bindings are decorated with the company's coat of arms. The idea of, um, of making binding stamps, incorporating heraldry, incorporating people's coats of arms, to use them to decorate bindings is one that goes back into the early 16th century in European practice. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of armorial bindings, as they're, they're commonly called, out there because uh, once the idea started in the 16th century, initially, typically for members of the royal family, uh, royal families of Europe, uh, the idea quickly spread then across society more widely. And it's a sign of the importance of heraldry in the early modern age. Um, lots of people who were entitled to use coats of arms, and you didn't have to be an aristocrat to be able to use a coat of arms, were very keen to display their heraldry as a sign of status, as a mark of their rank in society. So putting your coat of arms on a book was not only a handy way of marking your ownership of the book, but it was also a way of displaying the fact that you were a, an armigerous person and you could use a coat of arms. Um, and the the pictures on the screen here are just a random selection of uh, armorial book bindings made for individuals marking their personal ownership of, their, of these books from the early 17th century through to the 19th. Like I say, there are lots and lots of examples of these kinds of armorial bindings out there. Um, <clears throat> you also sometimes come across bindings that have got the royal coat of arms or parts of the royal insignia uh, used as binding stamps to decorate them. Um, and again, uh, it's something that, that you see not uncommonly from the 16th century right through to the 19th, the idea of making binding stamps incorporating royal insignia was quite popular right the way through those centuries, although generally it didn't indicate personal ownership of the books. They uh, usually, when you come across these kinds of armorial markings on books that are part of the, the royal insignia, they don't usually indicate that the book belonged to a member of the royal family. Um, it was used as a kind of loyal decoration, a kind of patriotic badge. Um, you quite often see these kinds of binding stamps on books with some kind of quasi-official status, Bibles, prayer books, almanacs, books of statutes, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and as I say, it was, it was a decoration that was felt to be appropriate to the, to the book, rather than, as I say, indicating royal ownership of the books, although you will not uncommonly find booksellers catalogues and library catalogues describing these kinds of things as um, having come from the royal library, having belonged to the king or the queen or whatever. Um, and occasionally royal insignia on a book do indicate royal ownership, but most of the time they don't. Um, uh, although, <clears throat> Uh, libraries and booksellers rather hope that they do, and booksellers feel that they can add a naught on the end uh, to their asking price if they think it belonged to the king. But sadly, usually, as in the case on the screen here, uh, they're wrong. Uh, so that's a kind of preamble to, um, to talking about my main subject, which is a little group of 17th century bindings which incorporate the arms of the stationer's company. And this is one of them that's that's on the screen now. Um, I know of four examples that survive. Um, those, we've got one in the company's library, there's one in the British Library, there's one in the Bodleian, and there's one in the V&A. Uh, but there may well be more examples out there. And if anybody who is uh, watching, listening tonight, um, knows of more of them or has got one on their shelves, then I'd, I'd be very interested to know. Um, the, 
In this case, the stamp is what binding historians call a panel stamp. Um, it's, a, it's a rectangular binding stamp. It's one single block that it was made big enough to decorate the entire cover of a small format book. And although these kinds of bindings look very fancy at first glance because they're extensively gilded and, you know, you look at something like this and you think, ah, oh, you know, that's, uh, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of individual tooling has gone into making that decoration. It's actually one single block uh, that's been applied with a layer of gold leaf onto the surface of the binding in order to create this thing. But you do end up with something that does look very handsome and, and really quite fine and fancy. Thinking about uh, Paul's fine and fancy uh, binding in the, the last presentation. Um, the company's arms are only a small part of the overall design at the very centre, but they are unquestionably the company's arms. Um, uh, if you compare them, the, the little blow up with the an example, a 19th century example of the company's arms that's on this slide, I think you, know, you can see it is definitely the stationer's company's arms, which is at the center of that design. Uh, and as I'm sure everybody here knows, the company's arms are on a chevron between three Bibles closed with clasps, an eagle displayed with a nimbus between two roses in chief, issuing out of a cloud irradiated the Holy Spirit as a dove. And without doubt, that is what you can see, um, both in the, the black and white representation um, and in the, the stamp itself. The four books on which, um, that, that, I, that I know of as surviving examples of this thing are all different. <clears throat> um, they're all small format, 12 duodecimo books. Three of them are early 17th century devotional books by, popular Puritan authors of their day. Um, Meditations and Vows by Joseph Hall, A Threefold Resolution by John Dennison, um, Lewis Bailey's Practice of Piety. Uh, like I say, they're all um, small format, popular devotional books that sold in huge numbers and were very widely read and used at the time. The fourth one is mysteriously different. It's quite a lot later. Uh, it's a book by John Evelyn, the char a character of England, published in 1659. So that stands rather out of step with the other three. And that's only one of the mysteries that, that surround these books because the, the big puzzle, I think, and I haven't got the answer to this, I invite um, answers in the chat or on a postcard or whatever. Um, the question is, what is the significance of the company's arms on the bindings of these books? I don't think they represent any kind of ownership marking. Um, you know, they didn't belong to the company. Um, I don't think it had a library of any kind back then. Um, I, I, I don't think, as I say, that they indicate company ownership. I don't think it's any kind of bookseller's mark. Um, I mean, there are rare examples of bindings of this period that are decorated with some kind of device which you can link to a bookseller of the time and you think all oh, right that that that's a, a bit of a selling mechanism i don't think that's what's going on here i did wonder whether there was some connection between these books and the english stock i mean that's the obvious the obvious question to have in one's head, I think. Um, but none of these books were part of the English stock, as far as I'm aware. Um, they were all um, printed for and sold by different booksellers. So the, the copyrights were, were manifoldly held. Um, there is no obvious connection like that. The, the company's copy um, which is the, the Lewis Bailey practice of, of piety, um, uh, was given to the company by the distinguished binding collector, uh, John Rowland Abbey in the 20th century. So the company hasn't had it for a very long time. Um, it's a book that's got 
quite a bit of early ownership and annotation markings in it. It's got some later 17th century uh, ownership inscriptions, and it's clearly a book that was well used and read and studied for devotional purposes because it, there are lots of, of notes on the fly leaves in the 17th century hand showing that they were clearly using the book. Um, but none of these books has got an ownership inscription that that actually goes back to the the imprint date none of them have got ownership inscriptions as early as the early 17th century um so there's no thread that we can connect that we can we can join up there my best guess is that the the creation and the use of this stamp is is a purely decorative one. It's a little bit like the use of royal insignia on lots of bindings. Uh, it's, it's something that was thought to be suitable, appropriate uh, for the books because of the connection between books and the stationer's company in, in, the, in, in people's minds at large. And in that case, it is perhaps a some kind of signifier of that that connection in in people's minds more broadly between books and the stationer's company in the early 17th century uh, but it, it is a bit of a mystery they are handsome little books uh, they are definitely interesting um, as i say i suspect there are more out there uh, but quite why the company's arms was used on this stamp on these books is a bit of a mystery uh, and I invite all of you uh, to solve it uh, to come up with any ideas uh, as to uh, what it might signify but I'm afraid I don't have uh, I don't have the answers myself but they're interesting books Thank you very much, David. I mean, what a what a puzzle. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what's but what sort of control might there have been over the use of the company's arms? I don't know. I think that's <clears throat> that that's a good question. Um, you would imagine that um, that there would be some some concern some wish to control the use of the arms um the you know the the obvious inference that there must be some connection between the creation and the use of this stamp and the company um follows on from that but quite what and why um whether it was made at the company's direction in some way um but but why just why why would they why would they want to see something like that created um i don't know it's it's a mystery hmm. um presentation copies by <clears throat> yeah I, I mean um mike james has has wondered whether the Perhaps the owners might have been members of the court, and and Paul has has put mm. in whether these were uh, presentation copies to the company by a significant printer or publisher. Mm -hmm. but they're they're quite small, um, quite quite cheap books. They are you know they're small devotional English language duodecimo books. They're not they're they're kind of nothing special and if people were presenting books to the company uh and having them decorated appropriately why are there not more why are there not bigger formats why mm, i don't know <laughs> I, I, I wish i could provide some answers rather than just teasing questions yeah. but it, it's intriguing Yes. Well, we'll let people mull that over uh, while uh, we, we go while, while we go on, um, and uh, we will move now to uh, to uh, Dr. Rebecca Barr, who 
uh, is a fellow of Jesus College in, in Cambridge, and we're going to move on into the uh, 18th century, becoming very, very modern uh, now. Um, Rebecca is uh, an authority on, on 18th century literature. Um, uh, she, uh, she is a Cambridge graduate, but has, has taught in, in Oxford and in, uh, in Ireland uh, before returning uh, to Cambridge. She is an, an author, um, getting on for at least 20 essays and articles uh, on the 18th century, and a lot of them on Richardson um, have been published. And uh, she is at the moment preparing um, a collected uh, edition of, uh, of, of essays um, on, the, on the 18th century. And she is going to talk about Samuel Richardson, who was indeed a truly uh, remarkable uh, um, stationer, um, a printer, a publisher, the master, uh, an author, uh, and someone who, as we will hear, is very, was very, very uh, innovative um, in how he printed and how he marketed uh, his material. So are we ready to go to Rebecca's recording, Lucy? Hello, I'm Rebecca Ambar, and I'm a fellow of Jesus College Cambridge, where I teach 18th century literature. And this century is one in which literacy expanded alongside a vibrant market for books, and especially for fiction. In the novel hungry history of the 18th century, there is one figure who is impossible to ignore, and that is Samuel Richardson. Richardson, whose portrait hangs in Stationers Hall, is undoubtedly the most important person in the history of the novel for a hundred years. He is the most central, the most internationally famous, the most influential for generations of writers, both women and men, whether they loved or hated him. But Richardson's cultural centrality as an author is made possible by his career as a printer. Before he began writing his best-selling novels, Richardson was a highly successful printer and member of the stationer's company. Because he worked so hard and indeed was very successful, he had little time for independent leisure. I seldom read, but as a printer, he claimed. So this was someone whose literary education happened not at university or school, but during his working hours. Richardson became a freeman of the stationer's company in 1715, and 300 years ago in 1722, he was promoted to the liveryman of the company. In 1754, the year he published his final novel, Sir Charles Grandison, The History of a Good Man, he became master stationer of the company and remained a member until his death in 1761. Richardson was a man who succeeded in two professions. So his life story is one of hard work, diligence, professionalism and upward mobility. In many ways, his literary career exemplifies the mission of the stationer's company itself. That is, his books show a commitment to excellence and innovation in publishing. His books also reflect the personal integrity and attempt to promote public morality and ethics. But they are also, I think, concerned with ensuring the financial success and sustainability of quality publishing and their creative approach to fiction. I'm going to talk about how Richardson's books are equally the products of him as a printer, as well as a literary author. I'm going to think about the ways in which these works of literature reflect his trade and craft. As Catherine Ingrassi has noted, as a master printer and therefore proprietor of his own business, Richardson recognised the need to diversify both his products and his clients. Novels were a thrillingly new market. They allowed Richardson to apply the tools of a trade he perfected and bring them to a different audience. They allowed him to be creative. Richardson was nearly 50 when he published his blockbusting, best-selling Pamela, Virtue Rewarded in 1740. 
This novel in letters told the story of a servant girl's resistance to her young master's campaign of sexual harassment and its ultimate reformation by her virtuous example. It didn't present itself, however, as either a novel or a romance, but instead a scandalous collection of real life epistles published for a reading audience. But either way, Pamela created a publishing frenzy and spawned hundreds of spin-offs and imitations. After a lifetime printing works that range from parliamentary records to encyclopedias, from romances to dramas, Richardson was an unusually canny first-time author. When publishing Pamela, he not only minimised his financial liability so that if the book failed, he wouldn't have to lose money, but his literary genius combined with his shrewd business sense meant that this novel was never going to be anything other than a huge success. Pamela was original, passionate and vibrant. It provided readers with a morally questionable happy ending to a melodrama when Pamela married her rich and upper class employer and erstwhile predator. It was a con controversial work, but it's important to note that there was no escaping Pamela. This novel and the character it portrayed was the ultimate talking point for English society, both elite and middling sort. But it was Richardson who ensured that Pamela was impossible to escape. He used his publishing and media networks to print numerous advertisements for the novel. He promoted it in journals and newsletters, and he added puffs, celebrity endorsements of the novel, which testified to its miraculous powers of entertainment and its ability to improve the morals of even the naughtiest and most reluctant readers. Pamela went into numerous editions, its for limitations, rip-offs, Pamela merchandise and prints, as well as forcing Richardson to write a sequel. And his second book, Clarissa, not merely built on the success of his first sentimental tale, but it experimented with its possibilities, raising it to new heights. In Clarissa, Richardson worked with the potential of the narrative form but also with challenging the tastes of its audience. Even by contemporary standards, this is an incredibly long book. But rather than a happy ending, the long and torturous story of Clarissa refuses to give readers what they want. Instead, the heroine Clarissa Harlow is let down by her venal, grasping family and abducted by an aristocratic libertine, Robert Lovelace. He is fixated on testing Clarissa's virtue and having her yield to him, but eventually is forced to push himself on a drugged and still resistant heroine who dies rather than submit to social pressure to marry him. It's a very different work from Pamela. So Clarissa's daring provocation might seem to be merely a literary development, but again, I think the book itself shows Richardson's training as a printer. As a young apprentice and journeyman, Richardson's main role was that of compositor and corrector. As a compositor, Richardson would have organised pieces of type for the press, arranging them in lines called composing sticks before laying these within the confine, confines of a form or a rectangular frame. And you can see here um, a, a kind of modern a pair of hands uh, going about this very business, putting together lines of types, composing sticks that will then produce printed pages. And this is the same kind of process that Richardson would have followed as a compositor. And this meticulous process, I think, would have given Richardson a unique insight into what the printing press could do with a blank page. So in Clarissa, we see Richardson harness professional printing knowledge to enhance the emotional impact of the story. Writing in the aftermath of her attack, the heroine Clarissa momentarily becomes frenzied with trauma scribbling distress and incoherent parts of verse and half-remembered plays only to rip them apart and cast them aside. And Richardson's book presents some of these scraps in paper 10, seen here on the slide. And so here we have a printed page that conveys the psychological disorientation of fragments by experimenting with typesetting. Rather than remaining on the vertical line or the horizontal lines, the avant-garde page setup has diagonal lineation 
which emphasizes the psychological disorder of the heroine. You have to tilt your, your head to read some of the lines or move the book around in order to read them. So mental disorientation is shown to the reader through typographic eccentricities that disturb our normal reading patterns. This is not an accident. We know that Richardson printed this work. So here we have an author enlisting the press's capability to amplify his literary meaning. This is a very important moment because typesetting this kind of page would have been laborious and difficult. Fixing those diagonal lines are, is really hard. Um, to in, make sure that those pieces of text or type wouldn't move in the process of printing, Richardson would have had to insert furniture around the blocks of tape, uh, text, uh, wadding together uh, to ensure the type uh, didn't move whenever the printing was occurring. So it required an unusual and expensive concentration of professional labor. And though 18th century letter writers often wrote at angles in order to optimize paper usage, commercially printed books did not. So here we have a moment where Richardson's knowledge of book production allowed him to evoke the scribbled desperation of someone writing um, scraps of sad paper. And the result, as 18th century readers attested, was deeply memorable and affecting. Jane Collier, who's an 18th century reader of the novel, wrote that, quote, the pathetic incoherence of these scattered pieces of paper is uncommonly affecting. These are passages addressed entirely to the heart. Clarissa is a work of genius. It shaped European novels that came after it, and it is still taught today in universities across the globe. But it was a hard sell to fickle 18th century readers. Sales of the book dropped significantly when it became clear in volume four that it was not going to deliver a happy ending. And we know from trade accounts that many readers stopped there and didn't read the rest of the book and didn't buy subsequent volumes. But nonetheless, Richardson applied his commercial acumen to promoting the book and I think guaranteeing a long literary afterlife. He printed an extremely detailed table of contents for, leader, for readers who were too lazy to read such a gargantuan novel. He lured in lovers of his earlier work by tying it to Pamela. He even fiddled with the typographic detail and presentation of subsequent editions and solicited feedback from the public for ways to improve the novels. It's incredible kind of mind crowdsourcing um, to improve it and make sure it's an afterlife. But this commitment to Clarissa is not purely for financial reasons. Indeed, Richardson didn't do so well from, from this novel. Um, by this point, Richardson was financially independent, wealthy and famous. But because he believed that literature could morally improve its readers, he made a calculated risk to, and this is a quote from Richardson, to make Clarissa's story rather useful than diverting. But he nonetheless wanted it to benefit as many readers as possible. And what he called an age given up to diversion and entertainment, Richardson wanted to, and again, this is a quote from him, steal in the great doctrines of Christianity under the fashionable guise of amusement. So like his advice to apprentices, it was important that his novels were not really entertaining, but educative, guides to life and living. Literature and books were in some ways personal mission so Richardson not merely wrote brilliant books, but he made quality books. He used his artisanal skills to produce books that people not merely wanted to read, but that they wanted to own, and to be seen to own. These books became indispensable articles of cultural conversation. And the proof is that we continue to talk about them even now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, it's it's I'm also the case. Nice. It's also the case, isn't it, that um, he uh, he does different editions with different markets in 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 mind. Yes. Yeah. He's 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 very good at, at making. Um, you know, lovely little books, little duodecimos that, that will fit neatly into your your skirt pockets, um, and and more kind of lavish um, 
what we might think of as coffee table books that you can um, have out when people come round to your house, your country house, and show that you're reading improving literature and not not some terrible trash. But yeah, he he makes and they are they are beautiful books. I mean, I have this is and I, I I'm going to horrify the the book historians amongst me. Uh, this is a, a kind of first edition of Sir Charles Grandison I bought very cheap on eBay and the boards are off. I didn't I didn't make this happen. This is not my fault. <laughs> um, but you can see this is a very like smoke damaged edition. It smells really lovely. Um, but it's beautifully printed. I mean, the, the text is, the print is very, very crisp. Um, and, and this is a, a copy of his final novel that I, I didn't talk about, but which is clearly been read and annotated throughout the seven volumes. Um, and there's lots of lovely little marginalia and a note at the end that says, um, this is a very unfashionable book, but it's still a very useful book. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's probably absolutely impossible now in the 21st century to say that there is any, any definite Richardson edition of any of these three novels. Right. I mean, yeah. It must be a, a critic and an, an annotator's uh, delight, but to establish a text, it's pointless to try to establish a text. Yeah. Do we? We, we, we get close to what we think might be his nearly final version but he go he constantly goes throughout and corrects and tinkers. So with Pamela, he makes her slightly more polite in subsequent editions. She's quite a, a kind of saucy, um, lower rank girl in the first edition, and she she's quite um, vulgar in her speech. And he in the subsequent editions and the, the, the editions that his daughters, who I think were also married to printers, um, oversaw. There's there's considerable refinement of her language. So he, he's, he's always got an eye to the market. Um, he's always interested um, in thinking about ways in which um, the book can be perfected and made better. Well, we, we've got quite a lot of comments I, I see in, the, um, in both the chat and in the, in the Q and A. Uh, there are a lot directed at, um, at, at David who, who's been given a lot of uh, helpful, uh, helpful um, hints. Uh, Paul has commented that, that all the three of those bindings are before the Great Fire. Um, Edmund King has uh, 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 two questions. Uh, was the stamp used after application um, of the leather onto the board and is the stamp on both the upper and lower covers? Yes. Yes is the answer to that and <laughs> Peter Gotham says uh, might there have been prizes to students? Mm, now that's that that's an interesting idea. Um, uh, I'm not aware of any prize binding uh, being given in Britain as early as that. Um, I mean, there were prize bindings were given to students in, on the continent as early as that, but I'm not aware that there were any in Britain. But they'd be they'd be strange books to give as prizes to students who would probably have been given classical texts or something like that, rather than um, devotional works like that. So. I mean, all these these suggestions in the chat that I can see, I mean, it's um, I mean, anything is possible, I think um, it's um, um, uh, it's it, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And I, I think the answer to, uh, to to Stephen as to whether the authors or printers were, were Liveryman and, and mentioning John Field. I think that John Field was also a stationer, wasn't he? Mm. I think I think the printers were probably. I mean, they must have been men yeah. and liverymen. Mm. Um, I I don't know whether there's any authorial connection with the company. I rather doubt it. Right, right, right. And again, Helen has Helen Esmond has mm. has uh, su suggested that prominent stationers. Um, might have instructed the binder to add this blocking mm -hmm. to a limited number of copies. Yeah. Possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so 
other other people do 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 any of the panelists want to put questions to say to margaret or or rebecca or or paul i don't know if we've got paul back we have um, i i wanted to ask uh, uh, also to not perhaps to point out that, that we have the uh, to uh, richardson's question about apprentices as well don't mm -hmm. we which is fascinating the uh, to help apprentices to the stationers company which is a delightful little well not not bedtime reading perhaps but <laughs> an interesting little little book yes and we have reprinted it from time to time haven't we and mm -hmm. i i think it it makes a very nice Keepsake, both as a. No, yes. So, isn't it still given out to everybody who becomes a freeman of the of the city, of the city of London? I mean, isn't that the the, the guide to apprentices that everybody gets given a copy of when they when you get the freedom of the I city? Because because it's the, extraordinarily the uh, uh, it, it was uh, Wilkes who was a glover who did something to do for the freedom of the city, but I'm not sure whether that was a little, little guidance so much. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it's Wilkes, I'm not, I can't remember, I'm not sure. Who was the last person I expected <laughs> pontificating? <laughs> well, indeed. <laughs> I don't think I would be giving that out to apprentices, frankly. <laughs> It'd pick up bad ideas really quickly. <laughs> So, so Paul, if you're able, if you're able to un unmute, are are you able to? Get, does, it, does it work this time? Can you hear me this time? Yes. All oh, right. <laughs> so, so the, the, the question of, yeah. about the source material and um, uh, that Ca if Camden was going round and about, and and did he? Did he alter? I mean, did he change the text from edition to edition? Well, that's the second question is more of a challenge to me because I haven't tried to make any comparisons. I know that the certainly the sixth edition um, uh, had the steel, um, the copper plate engravings. So to that extent, it was changed. But whether he updated his text as he uh, acquired more information. I don't know. What, what we do know is that um, he referred back to antiquarians who'd been active 40 years before. So most notably Leland, who'd been sent out uh, with a commission by Henry VIII to go and look at the libraries of the various monasteries just in that period as they were coming up to start closing them down. And he did a, a vast sweep of these monasteries to investigate what they had. And I believe that uh, a number of the books went into the Royal Libraries, uh, but also that John Stowe got access to um, Leland's material and Stowe allowed Camden to access it. So there'd been field work done by Leland um, uh, rather than I think, um, rather than I think uh, Camden going out into uh, distinguished libraries, he may have accessed Dee's library, John Dee's library, before it was ransacked. Um, so there were a lim limited number of libraries, but I think that, you know, by the time he started doing his research, the monastic libraries had already been dispersed. Okay, and I I see that um, that Giles has put a question to to Rebecca as to whether the vertical printing took, took place, and they've been having private <laughs> conversations. No, 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 it's not private. It's not private. It's, it's in the chat. No, no, no. Um, but I mean, <laughs> they've been answering each uh, answering e each other. It's a um, it's a really good it's a really good question, and and I think it it mostly didn't. Um, you have something like Lauren Stern's Tristram Shandy, which is very experimental with um, with some of its use of type. Um, and there are, I think, earlier books in the 17th century which do quite interesting patterns and such like with type. But um, it doesn't seem to have caught off, uh, up, caught on in, in sentimental novels, which is exactly where it should catch on. Um, and I think it's because it's too much work. 
and that the printers publishing sentimental novels, of which there's a huge rash, are frequently not as skilled as Richardson. Mm. And, and I think that it shows, it, and he uses the same um, configuration of diagonal type in every reprinting of Clarissa. Um, you get a really ugly, I'll just like oh, <laughs> break my arm. This is the, the horrific um, 1985 um, Penguin edition of it. And it has a similar kind of com configuration. Um, but in electronic uh, editions of, pa of, of Clarissa, they don't do it. Um, and in, in, in ebooks of it, it's, it's really it's really hard to do it. So it's actually something where the printed book does it much better, and and actually it's hard to to achieve that level of you know zaniness if you want to. But experimentalism, innovation, um, so it didn't catch on. But it's because Richardson was too good, I think. So, so I'm, I'm alerted to the fact that in the Q and A, there's some, uh, there's some, there are three questions, uh, the, uh, uh, as opposed to in the chat. Um, uh, Martin Woodhead wonders if the company might have distributed copies to copyright libraries. Um, or retain copies, sample copies for their own records. Uh, and again, uh, um, someone that we don't know who it is wonders if, if simply there are such so few examples, um, because uh, that was might <coughs> uh, given to uh, to new members of the company. Do you have a view on that, David? Again, I think I think um, giving giving books to new members of the company that that feels unlikely to me. I don't think the company at that time would have gone to the expense of doing that, and I think that the the books themselves, uh, like I said before about the theory of student prizes, I think they'd be unlikely books to be given out in that kind of context, and. If, they, if the company was doing that, then you'd imagine it would be the same book. You know, you could, you could make more of that kind of theory if all the surviving copies, if all the surviving bindings were on the same book, the same edition of the same book, but, but they're not. Um, so and that, um, and that doesn't quite stack up to me. And um, giving copyright copies, again, um, I'm not sure that there was very much of that kind of stuff going on quite as early as that. The first, uh, I mean, I suppose the very first copyright um, donations, the books that went to Bodley, etc. It's just about that sort of time frame. But my understanding is that whenever books were sent out to libraries on that sort of copyright receipt, early copyright receipt basis, they were sent unbound. Um, the, I mean, the the booksellers and the stationers at the London end didn't go to the expense of binding the books. They sent the sheets out to Oxford or Cambridge or where, wherever, which is why those kinds of books in those libraries where they survive are usually in locally bound, um, you know, Oxford and Cambridge bindings. Well, thank you. Are there any more questions? Well, I, I think I should say uh, thank you very much indeed to Margaret, Paul, David, and Rebecca. I think some very interesting uh, themes and issues have come out of uh, this evening's archive uh, event. I think one, uh, one thing that we will certainly uh, look to uh, to develop is the the whole notion again of the book as a material object in what one can learn from bindings and the the way in in which a book is constructed and uh, and and put together and i think rebecca has shown us that uh we've just got to do something more about richardson um i <laughs> he's, he's clearly such uh, he, he was clearly such an important 18th century figure and sadly at the moment still in, in, in British culture, I mean the 18th century is at something of a discount. I mean we don't know enough about, 
uh, the literature and the uh, and the uh, the culture of that of that period. And given that this man was a great printer and a great publisher and a great stationer, um, uh, we should clearly uh, we should clearly build on that and and have a, a real occasion in which we can uh, drink lavish toasts to his spirit. <laughs> so. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you all. I I see that that one of the last questions is that um, is about a virtual exhibition which was promised in some of the earlier uh, uh, publicity for the evening. I'm afraid we we don't have that. We haven't been able to uh, to to do, to do that. But as uh, the this event itself has been recorded and so you will be able to uh once it gets into the um into the stationers uh archive as it were you will be able to uh you, you will be able to uh to look at it again and see the images um many of which do come from uh the stationers archive um and again, it reinforces the point that the uh, the care of the archive and making it available for uh, for use is a really it's not just an important obligation on the company, but it is a pleasurable uh, obligation for the company. Okay, so thank you all very much indeed. We're within three minutes of being cut off automatically anyway by running out of Zoom time. So again, renewed congratulations to all our speakers for wonderful, wonderful uh, talks. And we will hope soon to resume um, uh, the archive evening in the hall with lots of examples from the archive um, and the library. So good night, everyone, and thank you. Thank you.